the better chance at a second term. Oh my, now play nicely. Good morning, madam. How are you? Good to see you all. I'm my very friends. pleased to see you Lovely. in the front row. Are you enjoying your day? Good day, madam. How very are you? Very good. Lady, pleasure. We have good news. Hello, my darling. How we are you? We meet again at the front of the room this time. Indeed. Good <laughs> afternoon, ladies, gentlemen. Good gracious. My dear Dolly, I am the most soft-spoken statesman in all of America, but I will say my greeting was entirely Adams in after that. Shall I try for you? Yes, indeed. Good afternoon. <laughs> we'll, we'll rile them yet. Uh, uh, ladies, gentlemen, for those who uh, had the brief opportunity for the, uh, what did you call it, press conference. I, uh, I, I wish in a few hours. We have I, a few more tasks ahead of us. Well, there is Mrs. Adams. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, upon that, I, I hope you Indeed. enjoyed the opportunity to, to speak uh, to several uh, of my predecessor, Mr. Adams, his wife, and uh, well, that uh, wholly brilliant woman, uh, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt. Oh, oh, a lovely creature. But upon that, we, we are fortunate enough upon this occasion to once more have the opportunity to address you. Now, for those friends who have uh, joined us, uh, allow me to introduce myself. Uh, I've had the privilege to walk with this nation every step since its inception. Uh, bearing a part of the better part of uh, 40 years. Uh, I've been referred to by some as a statesman. I have served in the General Congress as a member of the House of Representatives. Uh, to some, I, I am referred as the father of the Constitution, author of the Bill of Rights, and for these last eight years have served as your Chief Magistrate and President. Uh, my name is James Madison, at your service. Oh. <laughs> I like these people I a great do deal. As well. Yes. And I have been called many things in my time, some of them kind enough, Queen of the Republic, Presidentess, things we won't mention also. But I am ever your humble servant and wife to this wonderful fellow, Dolly Madison. <laughs> Well, uh, upon that, my dear, I should say, um, shall we uh, raise upon the stage? Indeed. It should certainly give credit to my height. Hey, as we ascend, my friends, this is an exciting day. We have some news <laughs> for you that I think you will, that was you fun. will find it was a great relief. Uh, oh, thank you, my dear. Of course, my darling. We shall ascend. Now, of course, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you will know full well that for the better part uh, of these last three years, the current condition in America has been without parallel. We have found ourselves once more faced in a contest of arms with our former mother country. A war which has been waged upon the high seas, a war that has been waged in the western frontiers, a war that has been labeled by the Federalist Party as Mr. Madison's War. Upon that at the present moment, soldiers spill their mingled blood in defense of an idea. An idea birthed in 17 and 76, etched into the words of our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created. Oh good, they've read it. They have. <laughs> that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are. Well done, friend. A bloody revolution was fought to secure those various ideas. A revolution which carried for the better part of six years from the Battle of Lexington and Concord, just a stone's throw from here, all the way to the Battle and Siege of York in 1781. Now, thankfully, I need not ask you, but I will, who won that revolution? America. America. <laughs> its people, its blessings of liberty secure, and from that we made a perfect government, yes? yes. No. <laughs> no, we most certainly did not. No, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, I've often written that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. No system of government can exist because is man perfect? No. Because of this, the system of governments that men make never will be. Now, after our independency, a constitution was written for America referred to as the Articles of Confederation. Have you heard of this? It was a system of government that treated each of these various states as their own country, fixed with their own money, their own trade, their own militias, their own defense. We had no way to pay off our debts from the late war against Great Britain, and moreover, we began to view ourselves as members of separate families instead of one nation. Now I immediately began to get to work. I began to read everything I could about ancient history. I spent the better part of a year reading almost 300 books. And from that, do you know what I learned? 
there is no perfect way to govern. But I began to wonder if there was no perfect way to govern, perhaps there could be a more perfect way to govern. Now, all of this led to 17 and 87, June and summer, whereby a representative body of some 55 men wrote a new contract of government, a federal constitution drawn from all the best of history in hopes to shun the worst. This constitution has endured a great deal over its course of time. And I will say I, I received a great reputation as an adequate statesman. And yet I will say, laying the groundwork of all of these various ideas pale in comparison to my greatest accomplishment, uh, which is, of course, my wife. Oh, you flatter me, dear. I do. <laughs> well, I will. I, I'm certain you're wondering, friends, where was I through all of this? Now, in the year of 17 and 76 that he spoke of, when this new nation was brought forth, this idea of this new nation, do you know how old I was? I was eight years old. I was very young. And so I was born into a changing world, radically changing world. Uh, this war that he speaks of, that we won, that America won, that you so, so rightfully understood, the year of 1783, when the uh, Treaty of Paris was signed, I was 15 and moving to Philadelphia. My family had um, recently manumitted, meaning freeing, freed all of their uh, enslaved people. My father, uh, a Quaker, my family a Quaker, uh, took, took into his own that challenge that the Quaker faith put forward of manumitting slaves. And so, our eight people were manumitted, and we moved our family to Philadelphia, where my father was going to, going, planning to become a starch merchant. And all the while, this world continues to change. And I grew in Philadelphia for some time. I married a man named John Todd, and we lived three happy years in marriage. And all of the while, I had heard of this fellow, this James Madison, this father of the Constitution. And sadly, in 1793, the yellow fever swept the city of Philadelphia, leaving me only with my oldest son, John Payne Todd. And throughout the ensuing 11 months, I began to hear word of this well-known gentleman, this James Madison. And uh, a mutual friend decided that we ought to meet, and so we did. And then we married, not, so, not long after, at my sister's home. Uh, uh, she married a, a George Steptoe Washington. We married in their parlor. And I went above stairs, and I revisited a letter that I had written to my sister earlier that day. I had signed it, uh, Dolly Todd, my name. When I returned upstairs to send, fold the letter and prepare it for sending off, I realized my name had changed. And I wrote, alas, Dolly Madison. And things began to change for me after that. I should I say they say. did. You went from living in the metropolis of Philadelphia mm. to the most obscure corner of the globe, a plantation of some uh, 5,000 acres, 10,000 total. Beautiful. Indeed, but remote. Quiet. Which I prefer. <laughs> I do not prefer. And indeed, our retirement would be short-lived. Yeah. For indeed, soon we would be pulled back, back into a new metropolis still being built, that of Washington, D.C. The election of 1800 saw one of my dearest friends, Thomas Jefferson. It said of myself and Mr. Jefferson, no two brothers are as close. He became the third president of the United States. He called upon me to be his secretary of state. To, Haran for, to handle foreign affairs. I know not why he did. <laughs> I've never left the country, but I rose to the occasion, bringing you with me. Amen. Our earliest days spent living with Jefferson in the president's mansion Indeed. until we could find our own home. And oh, my dear, how quickly you made that a home. Ah, well, it is one of my greatest joys in this, in this life, is to create a home that is welcoming to all people, welcoming and, um, and full of delight. And I, I began to take that on early. That is true. On F Street, it was a lovely home. Many fond memories there. And that is when we began the practice of Wednesday night. Wednesday night squeezes, they are called, because I invited so many people to my home that everyone would have to squeeze into the room together. 
Oh, this is a practice we continue to this day, and one that has proven very useful, and not just, um, not just for social graces, but uh, useful politically as well. Uh, I am hopeful that every time I invite someone to my home, I'm able to help them find someone else that perhaps they don't agree with, or perhaps they might get um, a good use out of a relationship. And by forging these connections, uh, well, hopefully I have continued to allow you to prosper in uh, You have politics. exceeded all expectation. Mm. As my dear Dolly wrote to me once, our hearts know each other. And I should say this is the reason why at dinner my Dolly sits at the head of the table. I know, radical. I uh, find my comfortable place in the center. And it was this self-same skill of hospitality that in every instance I will say secured me the office of the presidency. Mm. In the election of 1808, my political opponent, Charles Cotsworth Pinckney, said he would have had an easier time standing against James Madison if he was not standing against James and Dolly Madison. <laughs> In everything, my dear, we have been partners. The presidency is no exception. And it was the hope of our administration to bring back these fractured political parties that had grown so divided over the course of the previous presidential tenors. But of course, our internal affairs were nothing compared to those of the external. The British Empire, consistently endeavoring to wage war against revolutionary France, sought to kidnap American sailors upon the high seas, to make them bear arms, carry weapons in defense of a country that was not theirs. Simultaneously in our backyard, the western frontier, the British Army consistently incited American Indians to wage war against American citizens. Now from that, there came a growing group of people called the War Hawks. War Hawks who wished to see a war with Great Britain to see America's injuries revenged. Now once more, what does the president do? Does anyone know? Yes. The president keeps everyone in order. Mm. That is very, very good. Well said. Imagine for a moment, if you will, that the Congress, your, your representatives in government, was your body, right? All the various things that keep you healthy lie right here. Imagine the president as your arms and legs. So you have this body, your lawmakers. Suddenly you have the president, which allows you to move. The president, which reaches for friends. The president, when necessary, who defends the body. Now, from the course of that, I will say I've never been a soldier nor a violent man. The most violent thing I've ever done is sneeze. <laughs> but from that, the call of my nation compelled me to declare war and to make war. And in June of 18 and 12, Congress put forward the de declaration of war by my instruction, and I affixed my signature to it we once more found ourselves at war with Great Britain. A war which was fought upon the high seas and furthest frontiers, a war which was very quickly called Mr. Madison's War. A war which in 18 and 14 would bring it right upon our doorstep. The enemy making its way just outside Washington, D.C., I rode into battle, pistols placed upon my saddle to command the army, giving you very specific instructions. Indeed. This is a day that we had hoped would never happen, though we did prepare as well as we could upon the notice that we had. We never thought that the British would invade Washington City. We thought, um, we thought that we were safe where we were. However, precautions were made just, just in case. Uh, some of those plans included um, the stowing away of the cabinet papers, uh, getting them quickly out of the city so that they would not fall into British hands. Uh, other, other preparations were made a, as quickly as they could be when we saw that the British indeed would move into our city. Uh, I was left at home. I chose to stay home of, at the presidential mansion while he rode out to Bladensburg, Maryland. I thought that he'd be returning that, uh, that evening with officers, and I had a meal prepared for their return, wine set aside, had the table set. Uh, little did I know I would not need it later that day. As the time grew near, r rumors continued to circulate in the city. People kept coming to the house to tell me, you must leave. 
They will be approaching your home. You must get out, Mrs. Madison. And I held my ground, and my husband here says that he is not a violent man, and I fear that perhaps sometimes I am um, uh, unladylike in the fact that I keep a sword nearby, a saber sharpened, just in case. I, I have never had to use it. I would not call myself a violent person. However, that day, I thought, I would be so unladylike if I could find cannons. I would put them out the windows of our presidential mansion and aim them at British troops, had I been given the chance. L luckily, there were no cannons, and I was eventually asked to leave. But it, before that, I, I decided that there's some things that must need be saved. The first, well, what would you take? If your house were to be set on fire, which is what the British were doing, they were going about the city setting uh, buildings on fire, primarily government buildings, and because our home is the presidential mansion, that was to be set ablaze as well. If you were fearing that your home would be set on fire, what would you take with you? Yes. Special things that you want. What? what yes. Nothing. You would take nothing. You would go quickly and keep safe. That's wise. Uh, say it again. What? Oh, food. That's it's very, very, very smart. Yes. Paper and pencil. So you could communicate. Very smart. Yes, back there. Your cat. Yes. A costume? I'm, that's, I, you, you need good clothes if you are going to continue in life. I, I understand that. Yes. A picture. Oh, this is very astute here. Well, you, my friends, I must tell you, I'm here. Oh, yes. Yes. A disguise in case you were to be chased down. Oh, these are very smart. I should have consulted you before I left. Yes. The TV. Oh, Apparently, just familiar. two letters of the alphabet T and the rest can burn. The V. We don't need the rest of the letter. Yes. The six-year-old said he would take a fire truck with a pump. A fire truck with a pump. Very, very smart to put out fires with. Oh, indeed. Very good thinking. Yes. Books, also very good thinking. Well, my friends, I thank you for sharing what you would take with you. I must tell you that many of the things you have offered today are, are things that I thought I'm, I important to me as well and my husband. Of course, we've talked about the cabinet papers, similar to books. And you mentioned that you would take your cat along, my friend. I have a, a parrot named Polly. And I sent Polly off to the Octagon House, which is where we now reside uh, after the burning of our home. So Polly was safe. I, I took um, uh, curtains because uh, I fought very hard for the curtains, red velvet curtains, and perhaps some might criticize me, but I could not let them burn up. So I, they were very tall curtains. I had them removed and taken along. Some silver, but most of my personal effects, my husband's personal effects, left behind. Uh, indeed, you said a picture. A, a, a picture of what? Different presidents. Uh, you must have heard about me, my dear. <laughs> there is a story that many people talk about regarding this event. Uh, and, and there's a, a bit of rumor surrounding it, but I will tell you what I decided to do that day. As, uh, there were, as you can, I've told you, is chaotic in the home. And we were deciding what to take, and someone at some point mentioned we should take this portrait of General Washington, painted by Gilbert Stuart. And I thought that was a very good idea. I don't remember who mentioned it first, but I ordered that the painting be removed. For the point being, if I were to be captured and, and sent to, with the British, it would be a very bad thing indeed. If the portrait were to be captured and sent with the British, they could parade an image of our unity uh, across the streets of London. Uh, and we did not want that to happen. So I ordered that the frame be broken and it removed from the wall. Now there's an inner frame and I found a wagon for it to go on with two gentlemen from New York. And uh, someone said later that day they saw General George Washington sticking up above other things on the wagon. And so I did indeed take the, the picture as well. Uh, but that day we learned that, that all of these things that are being saved or burnt or kept from us, we learned that we have built this 
place, this idea of unity and this idea of empathy. And, and though we are divided, very divided, we have built the idea that we can, we can find unity together. And though these things are burnt, these ideas cannot be burnt with our buildings. They cannot be taken away along with Mr. Washington's image. Uh. Indeed, I suspect what the British did not realize when they ignited that fire was the great flame that they ignited into the hearts of every American. For soon thereafter, we began to see greater victories. And we come today to bear the exciting news to you that recently arrived from Ghent in Belgium is a treaty of peace, a treaty of victory. Submitted to the Senate, we have found an end to this war and another chapter to America's revolution concluded. Now to that end, what have we gained from it? We still find ourselves vexed by a spirit of party. We still find ourselves stumbling in the woods, endeavoring to find our way. But we have learned that when we put aside our various differences, we come together by one idea, the people of America can accomplish miracles. I must wonder, my dear Dolly, with the time that does remain, if, if we might uh, open the floor to any uh, questions the general populace has, uh, uh, questions of fashion, uh, questions of politics, uh, uh, questions regarding you or I, uh, any questions that might be raised. Uh, have you uh, any curiosities, ladies, gentlemen? Uh, yes, madam. Yes, madam, you are. Ah, this is a turban uh, in the French style. These feathers I have ha had sent over from France. I quite enjoy the Parisian fashion. And when I have a friend or an acquaintance that is visiting, I will have them send whatever I can. M much, much to the apology of our financial life. <laughs> I, I believe that I spent um, nearly $2,000 uh, not long ago on items from France, so it, which is quite a sum. Uh, I, mean, I shouldn't speak these things out loud, probably. I suppose so. The shoes came back too small, though. Can you believe it? Yes, she even ordered some stockings, and they did not even fit my legs. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they came from France. I'll find someone who wants them. <laughs> you had a question, my dear. Uh, the young lady inquires, how did I get to be the president? Now, we can speak easily as to the electoral process, meaning every state appointing electorates, electing the president. And from that, I can give you the easy answer as I received the majority of the votes from the Electoral College. But how did I get to be president in true form? I spent the entirety of my life studying. I'm very shy by nature, uncomfortable in social environments. And I will say I, I am not the most likable person in the world. But from an early age, since I was your age, how old are you, my dear? Seven. Since I was your age, I have had a great love of reading. Do you like to read? I thought you might. And when I was your age, I, I would sit in my father's library and I would read every book he possessed. And so I made up for my insecurities. I made up for my shy nature by suddenly being the most informed person in the room. And it's this that allowed me the, the respect of men like President Washington, which you know I, I had the honor to write his inaugural address and Congress's response to it and his response to that. <laughs> the beginnings of our federal system of government were just me mumbling to myself. <laughs> but in truth, it, it, it was my devotion to this cause. And, and from that, uh, an examination of history on how to move forward. I think it is, is this that allowed me to become president, but in truth, I think it is my wife that allowed me to keep it. Yes, yes ma'am. I did two terms as president following the precedent set by George Washington and stepping down after my second term. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one last curiosity. I see the gentleman just in the back with his hand raised high. Yes, you. <laughs> How many books do you think you've read? How what many books do question. I think I have read? <laughs> if you can believe it, there are some 2,000 books in my library at present, and we have just 
opened up the bedroom downstairs to become our new library. More books. Uh, allow me to put it this way. I sleep typically four hours a night, and I wake up, I have breakfast, and upon a good day of reading, I will read until the sun sets. And so, um, for instance, when I was reading for the federal constitution and writing it, I read some 300 books. How many books I have read over the tenor of my life, I, mm. I must say, uh, and I do not flatter myself, likely several thousand. Mm. Do you like to read? Very good. Mm -hmm. Never stop learning. And that, my friends, is what we might take away. The notion of this American experiment is to never stop learning, never stop growing, and never stop perfecting yourself. I, I think, my dear, you said it best in a toast once, did you not? I, I, indeed, I did. Are you, are, shall I toast it now? If you wish, <laughs> only if you wish. <laughs> indeed. Well, my friends, I wish, you, I wish you all the happiness. I wish you to continue reading books. I wish for you to continue to, ex to, to get to know your neighbors. Though you might disagree with them, you might find there are things that you do agree upon. Share ice cream, share perspectives. Thank you, friends. <laughs> I'm, so so, I'm so sorry. <laughs>